the liberation of Lothal and the destruction of the Imperial Seventh Fleet was a major boost to the morale of the Rebel Alliance, as it proved that the Empire was not invincible. The Rebellion now took center stage, no longer hiding its opposition. But to the Empire it was but a minor setback, as across the galaxy, their ultimate weapon was almost ready to be unleashed. Welcome to the Wizards and Warriors channel. We're glad to have you with us for our second jump into the Star Wars universe. So please get comfortable, invite your Wookiee buddy over, pour some blue milk, prepare your outpost mix, and avoid death sticks. This is the story of the official beginning of the Galactic Civil War with the Battle of Scarif. Our galaxy has thankfully no space wars, but it is no less fascinating or beautiful. If you want to learn more about our galaxy and bask in its beauty, you've got to check out the documentary series called Secrets of the Universe by the sponsor of this video, Magellan TV, our most loyal partner and the documentary platform of choice of the Wizards and Warriors team. Magellan TV's documentaries strike a perfect balance between scientific value and production quality, and the sixth episode, Secrets of the Universe, is a perfect example of that, with a big dose of knowledge and breathtaking visuals. Our favorite documentary in the series is Death of a Star, which allows you to experience the awesome beauty and destructive power of stars. We've been recommending Magellan to all of our friends and loved ones, and we think that it's a great present for people in your life who enjoy history. You can join us and watch this documentary by using our link in the description. Magellan TV has more than 3,000 documentaries waiting for you, and up to 20 hours of new content is added weekly. All of them are in 4K and available on most devices, including phones and PCs. If you're a history fan or have friends and loved ones who are, a Magellan TV subscription is a great and thoughtful gift, and Wizards and Warriors viewers will get a one-month free trial by clicking on the link in the description. Following their victory on Lothal, the Rebel Alliance hesitated not sure what to do next, as the liberation of Lothal hadn't even been a priority, nor authorized by the High Council or commanding officers. The success of the Spectres laid the seeds of doubt among the soldiers of the Alliance, who were now apprehensive of Mon Mothma's continued insistence on finding a diplomatic solution, as well as other leaders' push for covert means and avoiding direct action. This led many of the common soldiers to defect to other branches of the rebellion, which had broken off with the rebel alliance. Among them was the group of Saw Gerrera, who had become known for his brutal and successful hit-and-run tactics, and was considered a dangerous terrorist by the Empire. Their divisions and quarreling would soon come to an end, however, as the Empire was about to finish its weapons program, codenamed Project Stardust. The Emperor's long-kept secret that was to give him complete domination of the galaxy. Let us step back to 23 BBY and the history behind the weapon. Project Stardust was a plan to build a colossally large battle station with the capability of destroying planets through a laser device powered by the energy of kyber crystals, which had long been used by the Jedi and Sith to power their lightsabers, and by this time was a new technology being pioneered in other uses. The project stemmed from early Sith plans, but truly found its roots during the lead-up to the Clone Wars, with the original plans coming from the Geonosian weaponsmith's Ultimate Weapon Project. These plans were given to Count Dooku for safekeeping, and he passed them to Chancellor Sheev Palpatine, who was the Sith Lord Sidious in disguise. Palpatine shared them with the Republic Special Weapons Group, and convinced them to build it, using the rumor that the Separatists were building their own super battle station. The project was to be kept under the utmost secrecy, and the truth would only be known to a select few, such as the future Grand Vizier, Mas Ameda, and the director of the Imperial Military Department of Advanced Weapons Research, Orson Krennic, with the latter in charge of the project. During and after the Clone Wars, Resources were diverted to the project by hidden means, using scientists to work on projects, such as scientist Galen Erso's Project Celestial Power, which had a pretext of researching sustainable energy. Resources from random mining operations were then channeled into the work, which was hidden near Geonosis. But despite the personal interest of Palpatine in the project, it took a long time to complete, as the need for secrecy put a strain on the available resources. 
This was compounded upon with the raids made by partisans on the lightly defended convoys, the Geonosian worker revolts, the covert operations of the then hidden rebel alliance, and more crucially, the work of the Khyber power system being stalled, as Galen and his family fled into hiding in 17 BBY after discovering the truth of their involvement with the help of Saw Gerrera. Krennic was very persuasive in keeping the worries of his superiors in check and his critics, namely Grand Moff Wilhuf Tarkin, who considered the project as a drain on resources. Despite this opposition, Krennic was able to make good progress, especially after the capture of Gelen Erso on Lamu in 15 BBY. Although the Kyber crystal power problem was solved and the work resumed, his belief that he had broken Galen would be Krennic's undoing. Project Stardust was entering its final phase by the time Lothal was liberated and Tarkin's first target upon its completion was to be the Rebel Alliance base once it was discovered. It became known that Gullen sent an Imperial cargo pilot who was sympathetic to the Rebel Alliance named Body Rook to deliver a message to Saw Gerrera, who was on the planet Jeddah. But when the latter arrived and delivered the message, he was imprisoned by the old rebel, who had grown paranoid and distrusted Rook's defection. The Empire, knowing that Rook held sensitive information, announced a big bounty for his capture, bringing what otherwise would have been a minor defection to the attention of Rebel Alliance intelligence, who started investigating and hearing rumors of a planet killer and Galen's message, but could not get into contact with Guerrera and his rebel group, called Partisans. They needed someone who could reach out to Saw, and to this end, they rescued and recruited Galen's long-lost daughter and old associate of Saw, Jin Erso. The mission was to be led by Rebel Alliance intelligence officer Cassian Andor, who would be accompanied by Jin Erso and his rewired KX security droid K2SO, and they were to head to the holy city of Jeddah to try to establish contact with the partisans, and then to find the pilot and the message. They did not have to wait long, as they were caught in one of the partisan attacks against the Empire, and escaped by the skin of their teeth with the aid of Baze Malbus and Chiratimwe, former guardians of the Kyber Temple that once stood in Jeddah. This rescue was temporary, as they were soon captured by the partisans. Jin revealed who she was and her relation to Guerrera, so they were to be taken to him as prisoners. After a heated reunion, Guerrera showed Jin the message in which her father revealed his efforts in undermining Project Stardust and the ultimate weapon named the Death Star. While Galen was working on the main weapon and the power supply of the station, he secretly placed a flaw within the reactor of the station, creating an easy way to destroy it. If the reactor was destroyed, the entire station would go with it. In order to find the reactor, they needed to get the Death Star's schematics, which he revealed were housed in the Imperial data vaults on the planet Scarif. Before they could leave, however, the Death Star entered the orbit of Jeddah under the command of Grand Moff Tarkin, who wanted to test the now complete station and destroy Saw Gerrera and the security breach caused by Rook. On his command, the station fired directly at the Holy City, destroying it nearly instantly and causing a shockwave that nearly killed the rebel team. Cassian, Jin, Baze, K2 and Chirrut were rescued by Rook. Guerrera and his partisans were not as fortunate. Having escaped Jeddah, they quickly jumped into hyperspace bound for Edu, with the intention of rescuing Galen as requested by Mon Mothma. But due to the stormy climate, crashed on the planet's surface. They decided to continue their rescue operation, but before they managed to save Galen, the Rebel Blue Squadron attacked the base at the command of Rebel General Draven, resulting in Galen's death. This showed that different groups within the Rebellion were still vying for their goals and were uncoordinated. With nothing else to do on the planet, Cassian's group stole an Imperial Zeta-class shuttle and returned to the Rebel base at Yavin 4. The Rebel Council was summoned on the moon and Jin and her comrades presented their evidence of the Death Star and its ability to destroy entire planets to the shock and alarm of the council members. Nearly all of them were now advocating for peace or calling for the disbanding of the Alliance, much to Jin's fury, who demanded an attack on Scarif to recover the plans and then destroy the Death Star. This plea was ignored. 
Storming out of the council room, Jin was met by her comrades, who informed her of their willingness to embark on the Scarif mission. Many other rebels were fed up with the council's indecisiveness, and also wanted to join her group. She accepted their offer and gave them their thanks. They left Yavin aboard the captured shuttle, under the callsign Rogue One. The planet was protected by an orbital shield gate, but Rogue One's Zeta-class heavy cargo shuttle had access codes. Having bypassed the security shield over Scarif, Rogue One landed with Cassian, Jin and K2 disguising themselves, and they made their way to the Citadel to get the schematics, while the rest of the team set up for a diversionary attack. On Jin's command, Rebel commandos blew multiple explosives on the launching pads around the Imperial base, and the action on Scarif commenced. After the bombs on the landing platforms were detonated, Krennic, who had arrived moments earlier, ordered an immediate response, and the garrison was deployed to the platforms, believing they were facing a large attack. The jungle helped the rebels, and their unit, led by Baze and Chirrut, ambushed the stormtroopers upon their arrival, who sustained heavy losses and were pinned down. The rebel attack was also aided by Rook and his men, who from their ship were misdirecting Imperial units through the comms, and diverting even more men from the Citadel. Their attack was eventually pushed back, however, by the garrison's AT-ACT walkers. The walkers were terrifying killing machines, with armor impenetrable to the rebels' small arms. The rebels were pushed back to the beach, and many were killed along the way, just as the last of them were about to be cut down. X-Wing starfighters from Blue Squadron suddenly appeared. Their weapons were more than capable of fighting the AT-ACTs. The X-Wings were unopposed, and the rebels easily destroyed the walkers, halting the Imperial advance. The main forces of the Rebel Alliance had arrived. Hearing the Imperial dispatch that Scarif base was under attack, Rebel Commander Admiral Radus learned that this was Rogue One's doing. He gathered his forces and made way to Scarif, contradicting the orders of the Council, much to the encouragement of the soldiers who joined him. The Rebel fleet consisted of Admiral Radus' MC-75 Starcruiser, the Profundity, four Brahatok-class gunships, six CR-90 corvettes, three EF-76 Nebulon B escort frigates, three Srena-class Hammerhead corvettes, twelve GR-75 medium transports, and were supported by Fighter Wings Blue Squadron, Green Squadron, Red Squadron, and Bomber Wing Gold, as well as the Ghost belonging to the Spectre Cell, which liberated Lothal from the Empire. The Imperial Orbital Garrison was situated around the Shield Gate itself, which was immobile, but held capable defense guns, as well as a considerable number of TIE Fighters within its docking bay. This was complemented by two Imperial I-Class Star Destroyers, Admiral Gorin's Intimidator and the Persecutor. Defending a relatively unimportant planet, the garrison was quite relaxed by the time Radus's fleet appeared. The Imperials were only getting reports that the surface battle was won, and thus left the shield gate open. As soon as the rebel fleet appeared, however, the balance of power shifted, and Radus ordered Blue Squadron under General Antok Merrick to support the surface attack. Many of his fighters and support ships got through before the shield gate was closed and helped their comrades. Now, with the ground situation stabilized, Radus went on the offensive, sending Gold and Green Squadron to probe the shield gate to re-establish contact with Rogue One, as the gate blocked their transmission frequencies. Ghost and Red Squadron were to defend the main fleet, while the rest of the fleet kept the Star Destroyers at bay. However, instead of using his superior firepower, Admiral Gorin took up a defensive position to protect the shield gate as he was waiting for reinforcements. The shield's defensive emplacements were too strong to overcome, and the rebels weren't able to break the shield with their medium craft bombers, and they were forced back when the TIE squadrons were launched as the Imperials outnumbered them. Radar sent Red Squadron in to reinforce them, but the battle was by now going ill, with one GR-75 transport as well as one Brahatok gunship destroyed, with the rest of the fleet heavily battered. However, the Rebel Admiral knew that retreat was not an option, and so continued to press the attack. At this time, all of the TIE Fighter squadrons were fighting within the perimeter of the Rebel fleet, which left the Imperial Star Destroyers vulnerable. 
When a breach opened in the TIE fighter's right flank, it was noticed by John Vander, commander of Gold Squadron, who ordered his bombers to form on him and immediately made a run on the persecutor with ion torpedoes and disabled the vessel. Suddenly, the rebels received a signal from Rogue One, as Rook was able to get through the shield's jammer. Rook told Radus that they had the Death Star plans, but they needed him to destroy the shield gate to send the data files, as they were too large to get through while it was still up. After confirming that he would do so, Radus formed an ingenious plan. One of his hammerhead corvettes, Lightmaker, captained by Kado Okane, was called up to implement it. After the crew was safely evacuated, with the exception of Okane and a skeleton crew, the Lightmaker broke off from the fleet and made a large swing around the Imperial's right flank, before turning alongside the starboard side of the Persecutor and then ramming straight into it. Lightmaker's crew ignited full thrusters after impact, causing the Persecutor to turn left straight into the Intimidator. Admiral Gorin ordered reverse thrusters, but by now Persecutor was turning too rapidly and smashed into the upper castle of the Intimidator, severing it in half and permanently knocking both ships out. Persecutor and Lightmaker then both crashed into the shield gate ring and destroyed it. This allowed rebels on the ground to send a signal, and almost immediately the Profundity received a transmission from Scarif as Jin successfully transmitted the plans from the top of the tower. With operational objectives achieved, the rebels started planning to rescue the ground forces and return to Yavin. But as they were making preparations, the Death Star exited hyperspace, with Darth Vader and capital ships not far behind. Knowing that Vader could handle Radus's fleet, Tarkin ordered a single reactor ignition volley upon the Scarif Citadel to safeguard their secret plans. Even the deliberately weakened shot from the Death Star was destructive, and this blast resulted in the deaths of Krennic, Rogue One, and all forces that were upon Scarif. With evacuation impossible, the rebel ships now began their jump to hyperspace. Half of the fleet successfully escaped, but Darth Vader's Devastator suddenly emerged from hyperspace, causing the rest of the fleet to pull away, with one GR-75 crashing into the hull of the Devastator and being destroyed instantly. The sheer firepower unleashed from the Devastator obliterated a Nebulon B frigate in a matter of seconds, and then pounded the already weak shields, destroying them and disabling the profundity. This gave time for the rest of the fleet to escape, while Darth Vader boarded the profundity to secure the Death Star plans they had taken. However, before he could get them, a few of the rebels escaped with the plans on Captain Antilles' ship Tantive IV, which was docked in the hull, and despite not being fully repaired, jumped into hyperspace with Vader in hot pursuit. So concluded the Battle of Scarif. The operation was a great success for the Rebel Alliance, with the only major blows being the loss of the Profundity, Admiral Radis and General Merrick, while the Empire lost all of the Scarif garrison. The fact that the Rebel Alliance now had the Death Star's plans meant that they now had a chance to destroy Palpatine's monstrous battle station. This battle, which was minor in size and number of participants, was about to change the course of galactic history. We will talk about the aftermath of the Battle of Scarif in the coming weeks, and we are planning to cover the battles of many other fantasy, sci-fi and space opera universes, so make sure you have subscribed and press the bell button. Please consider liking and sharing, as it helps immensely, and don't forget to comment. We'll try to read and respond to every comment, as we want to know what you think about this video and which videos you hope to see in the future. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.